So um, hi, everybody. I'd love to introduce uh, Fran Nellet from uh, Google DeepMind. Um, and he's done a lot of work on machine learning, uh, what's called uh, meta learning, and has recently applied his work to uh, weather forecasting. Welcome, Fran. Thanks for the introduction. Yeah, so uh, um, so today I'm going to present on behalf of the GraphCast team our, our uh, work on mid-range uh, weather forecasting. Uh, so the paper GraphCast, uh, you can already find it on Archive, and we've, we've also open sourced uh, the code on GitHub. Uh, so what's our problem? The, our problem is essentially predicting our uh, the weather uh, 10 days ahead uh, globally in the entire Earth at 0.25 degree resolution, both in latitude and longitude. So uh, more concretely, uh, think about it as kind of we have uh, essentially a grid around the Earth, and we have both surface variables as well as atmospheric variables that we want to predict, like temperature or wind speed or geopotential. And uh, each each one of them looks like this, like a dy dynamic field, like the east-west uh, east uh, wind in the surface, also a surface temperature, and again, uh, other atmospheric variables like temperature at eight, uh, 500 hectopascals. Um, but these are only three of the more than 200 variables that we modeled. Uh, the intuition and motivation of this work is that uh, traditionally weather models have been uh, essentially using classic physics. So we we roughly know the exact uh, laws of physics for the weather. Uh, if we had perfect information, of course we don't have perfect information, and be both because we have imperfect sensors and as well as because we have a finite compute. So um, weather researchers have had to make lots of approximations on top of this. Uh, so our hope is that machine learning can directly learn uh, a better approximation of the weather and given these constraints, um, because we have lots of data. Uh, in particular, we found that indeed we are able to learn uh, more accurate as well as much faster uh, models than state-of-the-art NWPs, numerical weather prediction models. Uh, and, and we present GraphCast, which is the best uh, um, model in mid-range uh, uh, weather prediction. And we also present a careful comparison against the uh, state-of-the-art NWP model, HRIS, from the European uh, Weather Agency. Uh, this is particularly tricky to do, given some, some of the circumstances, which I'll go on in more detail later. And finally, uh, one thing that is not uh, obvious uh, directly is that um, this we obtain better RMSC metrics, like usually we do in machine learning, but we also want uh, to get better consequences for the end user. Uh, so we also check that these better predictions in, in terms of metrics also translate to a better prediction uh, for extreme events. So more concretely, the model variables, uh, as I was saying, are different atmospheric variables, so geopotential, specific humidity, temperature, and then wind in the three cardinal directions. And we model this at 37 levels uh, of altitude. Out of, and in bold, you can see the ones that ECMWF, this European Weather Agency, reports in their scores. Uh, we also have surface variables, which are particularly important for humans, like a temperature, again, wind, uh, the pressure, and also precipitation. And finally, uh, we also have some uh, inputs that can be directly uh, predicted by, by hard-coded models, essentially like, like uh, the time of day, latitude, longitude, time of the year, whether there is uh, mm, land or we or or sea at a specific location and the altitude and also how much sun is radiating there so one thing that is uh not obvious is that the weather is very very large for typical machine learning standards so here you have an image of mnist and here you have imagenet the classic uh, computer vision um benchmark and our model graphcast because it models at 0.25 degree latitude longitude resolution uh, it's really, you should think about each variable as being a very high resolution image. Not only that, but images typically have three channels, RGB. Uh, in our case, we have more than 200 variables. So now each prediction, each time step prediction is going to be uh, much more than a single image. And finally, because we predict 10 days ahead at six hours resolution, we actually predict kind of four, 40 frames, but each frame has 200 variables. So that, that uh, comes to about 35 gigs which we believe is probably one of the largest uh, output examples in machine learning. So a question is why now? Why has this... Wait, wait. A first yeah. question about the data set. So the, the, we don't have weather station stationed that finely in space. So are these reanalyses of fast uh, weather? 
Yeah, yeah, exactly. This is literally uh, <laughs> the, the, the next bullet. Uh, if you're asking about the data set, yeah. So why now? There's three key factors, and the big and the first one is data. Uh, so we have available the Euro 5B analysis, uh, which is provided by the European Weather Agency. And it's worth noting that this is a simulation. So a simulation basically means going from raw weather sensors, right, uh, like satellites, like um, globes, things like this, or like ground measurements to the kind of an estimation of the true weather state. This is still based on classic physics, and this is not based on machine learning. So we take kind of an estimation of, of this uh, and reanalyzed re more than 40 years um, back. So we have a massive data set um, in, in, terms of, in terms of size, and that's why uh, that's one of the key factors in, in deep learning typically. And it's also very high quality data because uh, these, uh, there's been a lot of compute effort uh, gone into uh, amortized into this data set. The second key factor is compute. As you know, um, it's now more and more uh, useful for uh, getting um, performance. And now in particular, we train on 32 TPUs. Uh, and this just goes along the line of increasing scale in machine learning models. Our model itself is quite small, but as I was saying, our each input output example is uh, is very very big. So we really need the compute. But note that this compute is different than the typical compute in weather models. So before weather models were using uh, servers of um, uh, around 10,000 CPUs, and now we just use a few TPUs in in order to train. And at inference time, we only need a single TPU, which for non-Googlers is essentially like a high-end GPU. And we can do in one minute what it used to take a, a server uh, around one hour and thousands of CPUs. And this is because, again, we leverage parallel compute. And the third thing is progress in deep learning algorithms. In particular, we built on graph neural networks. Uh, so essentially, we are going to build a mesh around the Earth and think about this as a graph. And essentially, uh, the weather is going to inform uh, uh, the weather is going to inform nearby weather states um, by uh, passing messages along this graph. So the kind of short story of how graph neural networks work is they have a latent vector on each node in the graph, and they also have a latent vector on each edge in the graph. And nodes inform uh, the, their neighbors, and so they update their own uh, latent vectors by sending messages to nearby neighbors and then updating themselves based on the received vectors. So why do we build on graph neural networks? They have in particular key inductive biases uh, that we'd like from weather. Uh, one inductive bias, for instance, is locality because uh, you only nodes only send messages to their neighbors. We are essentially encoding the fact that weather is local. And so in a short uh, period, uh, the weather in London is only mostly going to depend on the weather in the UK. It's not going to depend on the weather in Brazil uh, in a short period of time. And the second thing is the equivariance. So that means that because we reuse the same parameters, the same neural networks on all the nodes in the graph, we're essentially encoding that the weather function is the same uh, in the UK than it is in Brazil than it is in Africa. And that allows us to be much more parameter efficient than if we uh, didn't encode this inductive bias. Uh, of course, these three key factors have been uh, playing on the entire community, not just us. So, whoops. Uh, so there's been uh, progress in weather using CNNs, also graph neural networks, Fourier neural operators, as well as transformers. And it's really been a wave in weather prediction uh, using deep learning uh, to improve upon um, classic physics. So let's go into more detail on how our graphcast, our, our model works. In particular, we receive an input weather state, and uh, we are going to predict the next state, in particular, six hours from now. Uh, so by using GraphCast, which uh, here is shown as a black box, but it consists of three parts. Uh, so the first one, the encoder, is essentially going from the grid, which, is, as I was saying, you should think about it as kind of a, a, a an image, uh, so a rectangular image. Um, but uh, this rectangular image is not uniformly distributed around the Earth. It doesn't know about kind of the spherical properties, the spherical geometry of the Earth. So we have to map it uh, up to a mesh. And so uh, this essentially informs the, the lo locally the, the nodes on the mesh. Then we use a processor, which essentially propagates the information around the, uh, the mesh and informs and predicts 
a latent uh, vector that informs about the, the next state of the weather. And finally, we go back to the grid because that's where the predictions are needed. And so we, we have a decoder that decodes from the mesh back to the grid. This mesh that I was telling you before is actually uh, what we call a multi-mesh. So essentially we have a few edges that propagate the information very far and many edges that propagate the information locally. And how this is made is we take an ecosaherin and we iteratively divide each triangle into four smaller triangles. And we do this up to six times. And so we're going to have uh, kind of some, a few nodes that propagate the information far, and then many, many edges um, that propagate the information locally. And we kind of pull all these type of edges together, uh, resulting in more than 40,000 nodes and 300,000 edges. Finally, we have autoregressive training. So the idea is that uh, the weather now is going, the weather function now is going to be the same uh, um, as the weather function in the future. So really, if we want to predict 10 days ahead, we don't use a single neural network call that predicts directly 10 days ahead. What we do is we predict six hours at a time, 40 times, and we train uh, for this autoregressive training. So essentially applying the function multiple times to work well. Our training loss is essentially mean squared error. Uh, and the average essentially happens over uh, the forecast time. So we have about 40 years of, of data. We also have to average over lead time. So we train the model to do well, both at six hours, at 12 hours, and at 18 hours, et cetera. And we also average it over uh, the entire globe. And again, over variables. We have more than 200 variables, so we also have to average over them. But comparing variables is quite hard, right? We, you cannot uh, just uh, output this directly because one, one um, one variable is in Kelvin, another variable is in meters per second, etc. So you have to weight them. And one way we weight them is by using the inverse residual variance. So what this means is, uh, is essentially that if you were to predict the input uh, for, uh, like if you were to predict the present state uh, for the weather six hours from now, on average, you would get a loss of one for uh, all the variables in the data set. And that's what we compensate for. Then we compensate uh, for different variable level weights. We give them, um, so the different levels in the atmosphere, we, do, we give them different weights because we notice that uh, lower levels in the atmosphere both matter more to humans and are also more impactful of the weather because there is more higher wind, uh, higher air density there. And finally, um, because the grid puts more uh, uh, points near the poles than in the equator, you also have to compensate for this. As I was saying, we have autoregressive training and most of the time we spend it on training a single uh, step. So in particular, we do 300,000 steps at a single autoregressive step, just training the model to do well at six hour prediction. And we do this uh, for multiple reasons. Number one is that it's faster because if we were to train uh, doing multiple autoregressive steps, that would mean that if we train with five autoregressive steps, it's going to take five times more. And so we found it useful to just train auto uh, with a single step. And the second one is that if you start with a very bad model, uh, and you train it autoregressively from the beginning, this can lead to instabilities. So we wait until we have a very good model before starting to train autoregressively. And this process takes about three weeks of training, so it's quite compute intensive. And then we fine tune up to three days. So essentially we do up to 12 steps, uh, 12 autoregressive steps because it's six hours uh, prediction. And this process takes up to one week. So these are the predictions uh, coming out of the training of our model. You can see that they look- A question uh, that you approach. Yeah. So, uh, well, how did you mesh it? Because you kind of quickly went through it, but it seems like that's an important part of it. Uh, you have a, one is you have a, if you can go back to the picture, it seems like it's a mesh that's different on poles. I mean, it's, uh, the mesh cells are smaller on poles than on the equator. So why that choice? Because wouldn't it bias your model compared to like a hex? Exactly, exactly. So that's why we have the, the mesh. So the grid is given to us by kind of the, the, the problem setting. So the weather community, they evaluate in different ways, but the most popular way is evaluating in the grid, this rectangular image that I was showing before. And that has more points uh, nearby nearby the, the poles. Uh, the, 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 and the density near the poles is very high compared to the points in the equator. And that would by our model. So that's why we create the mesh. And if you look at the mesh, the mesh is more uniform around the globe, right? And so uh, the mesh doesn't have higher density in some places than others. The mesh, you can find it- uh, It helps a lot. The bottom row. And so we first move to this kind of more uniform distribution 
of nodes, we propagate the information there, and then we go back to the grid. And the grid is kind of problem specified, we cannot change. Okay, and that's how you're dealing with uh, speed of causality, because uh, for every causal factor, you're gonna have different speeds, but you have a mesh for every speed. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So uh, we think that some processes move faster and, and some processes are smoother than others. And so that's why we have different layers of, of the mesh. Uh, all these edges happen simultaneously. So all the message passings happen simultaneously, the, both the long edges and the short edges. And the model learns to use all the different uh, edge lengths to propagate different types of information. Okay, then one more thing. You don't have a notion explicitly here of time or history dependence. Uh, is but you have mm. just yeah. longer distances uh, for so it means your maximum dis distance of history is one well uh, I guess quarter way around the earth if I can if I get it correctly is yeah. that right and is that good enough yeah that's a good question so technically we have sixteen message passing steps mm -hmm. uh, so there is plenty of time to go around the globe multiple times mm -hmm. so the model can learn some non physical non physically plausible uh, physics. Uh, it just learns about kind of data correlation and data information. It's not bottlenecked by by kind of speed of sound or things like this. Uh, now that we're on the, on the topic of um, temporal things, we actually, the input of the model is actually not just the present, but the present and six hours before. Uh, in, in theory, weather is Markovian, but we found that probably due to partial information, and kind of um, issues with data simulation, it was useful to have two time steps so that the model knows a bit about the dynamics of the model, of the of the weather as well. Okay, and actually, maybe it's a good time to ask this. So it's the whole Earth 40 years, but for the Earth, 40 years is not very much. Yeah. So how, to what, I guess, how badly is overfitting hitting you? Because it is just 40 years of a complex system. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that it's, it's, it's interesting because Four years sounds, well, uh, to, to some people, it may sound initially like a lot, but actually in terms of time steps at, at six hours, there's not that many examples. Yeah. But crucially, each example is super, super rich in information. There's lots and lots of losses. So actually, it's in terms of number of targets, if you think about it per time step, it's not that many. There's not that many time steps, but in terms of actual targets, there is lots of targets. Uh, we found that before doing autoregressive training, so if we were directly predicting, let's say, 10 days ahead, there was huge uh, overfitting. Uh, once we moved to autoregressive training, uh, the overfitting uh, diminished a lot. We still have a small L2 penalty, but we don't think we're overfitting too much. To be honest. All right, thank you. Yeah, because the data set is actually huge in terms of a uh, number of targets. Right. Yeah, it's a good question. Uh, okay. So, oops, yeah, so I, as I was saying, we have this uh, forecast, which uh, again uh, is the median error in 2018, which was our test year. And you can see that the predictions of graph cards in the bottom look reasonable compared to the ones on uh, from HRS. And you can see the errors also, of course, increase with time. And hopefully you can see that the errors in HRS on the top are slightly higher than those of, of graph cards. Uh, this is hard to see in images, uh, so let's look at it uh, quantitatively. Here we have a very standard uh, metric in the in the weather community, which is geopotential 500. Uh, one second, uh, and then we have uh, RMSC, so uh, a measure of, of the error uh, in terms of time. And of course, we're going to do worse as as the lead time goes on, right? Uh, and lower is better. And you can see that uh, graph cast in blue is uh, significantly better than than HS in black. Uh, for now, disregard the dashed line. I'm going to talk about it later. And uh, this, of course, uh, uh, to kind of remove this time dependency, we normalize by address and we essentially look at the percentage of improvement of graph cast on top of address. And you can see that, for instance, for Z500 is about 10% improvement. Uh, so we have 10% lower RMSC. And this can be done for many uh, variables like uh, two meter temperature or surface wind or specific humidity at 700 hectopascals. And for each of them, we're going to have a percentage of improvement uh, depending on the lead time. So for instance, you can see that at 2T, at the very beginning, we are slightly worse, and then we uh, become about 10% better, and, and then towards the end, we become just slightly better. And for other variables, like um, like the surface wind, we can be up to 30% better at the very beginning. 
But as I was saying, there's many, many variables. So we have to find a better way of, of representing all this information. And we take the uh, ECMWF scorecard, which essentially just a color map of these residual, uh, uh, of these um, relative scores. In blue, you can see where GraphCast is better. And the deeper the blue, the better GraphCast does. And the opposite, the deeper the red, uh, the better it does. Um, and you can see that uh, essentially we also have lead time uh, going to, towards the right. And we have all the different altitude levels for geopotential. And then here we have all the different uh, variables and, uh, and lead times leading to more than a thousand different targets. And the, the summary is that essentially GraphCast does better on 90% of those targets. Uh, and you can see that especially on the lower levels where humans care more about this, well, GraphCast does particularly better. Uh, so, of course, it's great to see that GraphCast can do a great job on, on these kind of RMAC metrics. However, the real world uses weather models that go far beyond these RMAC metrics. So we thought it would be interesting to study some of these extreme uh, weather phenomena that heavily impacts people's lives. We decided to focus on three applications, uh, tropical cyclones, atmospheric rivers, and extreme heat, uh, to show how GraphCast performance translates to these settings. We start uh, with tropical cyclones, and we essentially re-implemented the weather agency in the European Weather Agency Cyclone Tracker and applied it to GraphCast. And we, and we took the cyclones from the IBTrax dataset. And in this plot, you can see Hurricane Maria uh, from 2017, which was one of the first storms to ever hit Puerto Rico and the surrounding areas. And in black, you can see the ground truth uh, for five days. And in red, you can see the uh, forecast for ages. And here we observe that the address track totally misses the true track after a few days. And GraphCast on the right is much closer to the ground truth uh, for the full five days. Uh, so, of course, it's, uh, that one was a single, a single specific date, but measuring across the years of hurricane data. Yep. Um, can I ask, how do you extract cyclones? Uh, this is not really a graph cast question, but out of interest. How do you extract cyclone trajectories from your stack of 227 variables? Yeah, yeah. So, uh, the uh, ACMWF has a... a Open source, not open source the implementation of the tracker, but they, they describe how the tracker uh, looks like. And so they, it's essentially a combination of mean sea level pressure and then the winds. Uh, so uh, the center of the hurricane is essentially like a local, uh, a local minima of mean sea level pressure. And there's also a few criteria on locally uh, on like the vorticity of uh, that depends on the on the speed of the like different velocities uh, nearby. And there is a, I forgot exactly, but there's also a, 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 an, another criteria on the gradient on the, on the pressure. And so there is a few uh, technical criteria. I can follow up with you if you want on the specific, but th think about it as several criteria that the, that the local weather has to satisfy. And then you have essentially a tracker that, um, that just propagates and, 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 and tracks the, this local minima of, of mean sea level pressure. To initially detect the cyclone, uh, we start from the IV tracks data set. So there is nothing in our system that predicts here there's going to be starting a cyclone, but it's very easy. Well, not very easy actually, but it's it's relatively easy to uh, track the cyclone uh, once we know. Okay, if we if, if we're given here is the starting a cyclone, please track it. Uh, the what the there is enough information to know uh, where the cyclone is. So the cyclones, it, it's a it's a point in space. It's a two D coordinate, um, and then the it's a function that takes maybe the surface level variables and then spits out the, maybe the previous location and tells you where it's gonna move next, basically. Yeah, exactly. So uh, you have, we, so here we're talking about the center of the cyclone, Yeah. Uh, but uh, to really know where the center of the cyclone is, you need to look at, uh, at a nearby area. Think about it maybe like three, four degrees. And then um, based on the wind, for instance, uh, you know, okay, if there's wind going east, then the cyclone has to move east. And so you estimate, uh, oh, this the six hours from now, the cyclone is going to be near this area. And then you, near that area, you start looking for mean sea level pressure local minima. And then uh, there is a very specific algorithm that the CMWF um, open source uh, and published, sorry. And then uh, we essentially re-implemented that. One thing that we found is that the, if we literally re-implement their, their published tracker, it doesn't work quite as well for us because their tracker works for their uh, uh, for their predictions, and so we had to 
change some of the constants for some of these magical constants like for instance there is different thresholds on what the cyclone has to satisfy to keep being as a considered a cyclone mm -hmm. or which points uh not all the local minima of mean sea level pressure are uh good uh cyclone centered uh candidates and things like this um so we kind of search on validation data uh, for some of these um conditions for being a cyclone Am I and answering so your question? There's a historical database, I guess, of previous cyclones. That's right. So the Ivy Tracks data set, it's uh, literally a, a data set of cyclones. So the way this is collected is they have different weather agencies around the world, and then they they had all the, these conjectures about where the cyclone was at each time step. They don't quite agree with each other, and the Ivy Tracks picked uh, a reasonable uh, agreement between all these different weather agencies to kind of get at the gold standard on what, where each cyclone was at each point in time. Mm -hmm. And so we have, I forgot how many years we have, but we have probably more than 20 years of cyclone tracks available. And that's what we use for, for evaluating the cyclone performance. I see, thank you. And yeah, how this looks like is it's essentially latitude longitude, but there's also, if you're interested in cyclones in particular, there is more a lot more information on that data set. Uh, cool. So another one. So these yeah. nine hours and twenty kilometers. Well, what do they mean? Yeah, yeah. So uh, okay. So yeah, on the left we see that uh, we see the median track error. Uh, we reported median uh, on the main text because we found that uh, a hard coded tracker sometimes makes mistakes and just mistracks the the true track predicted by 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 our model. And so this was less sensitive to these outliers. But we also do better on on mean. And what we see is that if you look at HRES and GraphCast, uh, you see that the GraphCast error is, is lower, right? Um, and what these nine hours mean is that we can essentially warn with the same level of accuracy as HRES nine hours before HRES, right? Because our error is the same as HRES nine hours later. So we can warn uh, with the same level of accuracy uh, with uh, nine hours more. And on the plot on the right, we essentially look at uh, kind of the vertical distance for a single lead time how how low how much lower error we get uh with graphcast than uh with hrs and so we can say the location the, the center of the hurricane we can predict it with uh 20 kilometers better uh than than hrs uh, did i answer your question yeah awesome Oh, and then uh, one more thing. Uh, yeah. These are live things. So one challenge for dealing with any, any weather data is, is that you have satellite sensors and ocean buoys and whatnot. It takes a while for them to go up to central servers and then yeah. go into like a reanalysis like grid, um, which you yeah. t typically don't get in live. And but your data set obviously is is reanalysis. So how did you bridge that gap in freshness of data? Yeah, yeah. Uh, that's a, a great question. So I'm going to talk about this in a lot more detail in, in a few slides. That's number one. Number two uh, is that even HRS, so in, in practice, how it happens at, at deployment time is that you do reanalysis, uh, I think, uh, for a, like you're constantly getting the sensors and then you actually do reanalysis and go back three hours into the past and then predict from three hours into the past. That's how weather prediction is done in practice. Right. Uh, so you use the present to inform the model three hours ago, and then you predict from there. This, there was a bit di different, like the hour data set doesn't quite work with these three hours. And so we had to be very careful with that. And I'm going to talk about this uh, later. Excellent. Cool. We also looked into atmospheric rivers, which are a weather phenomenon that transport large amounts of weather vapor away from the tropics and can cause heavy rains. Uh, this is characterized by the integrated vapor transport, uh, which we call IVT which is something that can be computed from the weather uh, variables that GraphCast predicts. And we evaluated this over the U.S. West Coast during the cold season, which is a season known for uh, these atmospheric rivers. And we compared the performance uh, against Citrus. And we found that GraphCast now it's not nine hours, it's one day of accuracy better in, in IVT. Uh, and note that this IVT, we, di we did not directly predict this. This is a nonlinear transformation of the weather variables that we do predict. Finally, uh, we studied extreme heat. And in this slide, we studied the capability of GraphCast to predict the top 2% surface temperatures using precision recall curves. And we do this as a function of lead times, and that's why you have kind of three types of curves uh, plotted in different shades of the color. 
we find that for long lead times, the graph cast curve in blue is above the age risk curve in black, which indicates that the graph cast is better at the task, although age risk is still better at 12 hour predictions. This is not totally surprising as this is consistent with the RMSC for surface temperature. However, it, it is still great to see that the gains in RMSC extend to extreme predictions. And in the paper supplementary material, we show results for other variables relevant to extreme heat, uh, as well as other metric regions and including extreme cold, of course. And in general, we found that all these uh, extreme phenomena tend, tended to align pretty well with the RMSC results. So uh, going back to your question, a fair comparison against address. Uh, so uh, one problem that we found is to decide against uh, ground truth when computing metrics for age of the models. And to understand why, let's go through what happens when we make a forecast with our model. So we take an initial state from era five reanalysis, which is this 40 years in data set, and we feed it to GraphCast. And we do this because era five is the largest data set across all the years that we use for training. And so we, of course, want the biggest model for optimal performance. And this is going to produce a trajectory forecast. And then we compare it against the era five reanalysis data set to compute uh, all, the, all the metrics result. So, so far, so good. However, um, we also want to evaluate address, but we don't have uh, access to the address model. So what we do is we use uh, forecasts that have been historically uh, saved for each year from a specific initialization, and we call this operational analysis. And the problem is that uh, the operational analysis and the era five uh, reanalysis, uh, they're very similar, but they are actually not the same. And this is thought of, but as a result, if you compare interest forecast against the era five reanalysis, uh, ground truth, you will find higher errors uh, than expected. So after uh, careful uh, checks, we essentially decided to compare against uh, Kind of this operational analysis itself. Um, it makes essentially HRS look better than if we were to compare it in, in terms of era 5. There's also another issue, which is this assimilation window that we were talking about uh, on, on your question. Uh, essentially, the intuition is that uh, era 5 reanalysis goes from 9 to 6. So you can see that for some uh, some horizons, some, some starting points, um, this so what does an assimilation window is that, is that we integrate all this raw sensing information within one window to inform the weather states at zero hours and six hours. And so the zero hour starting point actually has some information leakage from nine hours into the future. So if you're not careful, uh, the mo uh, models initialized with ERA5 actually have a six hour advantage compared to the operational analysis which have different assimilation windows. Operational analysis always has six hours uh, assimilation windows and always kind of three hours, looking three hours into the future. And that's why we decided to only show results that started at six hours, because six hours only has three hours into the future. And similarly, we also only show uh, results uh, usually going uh, 12 hours into the future, so multiples of 12, because then you're in the same point in the assimilation window. So we only use uh, six hours and 18 hours. So, okay, so you still have this leakage, but it's the same as- uh, Exactly. Interest. Now we have we have leakage, but like interest does and like any weather model in used in, in the real world, they all have three hour leakage. And that's why they start from three hours in, in a deployment scenario, they start from three hours into the past. So we have to be very careful in some papers Initially, and even as initially, we had made this mistake of comparing uh, results on address at, at zero hours and 12 hours, which is kind of the most intuitive. But we found that actually we had the six, uh, six hours uh, leakage bigger than address. And so, uh, fine, uh, in, I think we had actually this mistake in the first version of the paper, but the second version of the paper corrected this. Or maybe I forgot, maybe we corrected it bef even before the first version. Um, yeah. I'm just curious. So when they, um let's say the operational analysis, if you take data three hours into the future and, and absorb it, assimilate yeah. it, then and then you start rolling forward again, you're going to re-predict essentially kind of what you trained on or what you conditioned on. And then, of course, you're going to make novel predictions. What's yeah. the discrepancy like when you re-predict back what you've already seen? <laughs> uh, it's like sort of internal validity, right? Do people track that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a, that's a great question. Uh, we, all, we actually found this uh, 
this issue and we found that it's actually much easier to predict within an assimilation window than mm -hmm. across the simulation window as far as we know when we were discussing with uh, the weather agency and and other models uh, we were the first ones to kind of see this big um, being a big issue i think people had kind of because the air fiber analysis data set had not been used as a machine learning uh, data set until last year there were some of these issues literally had not been realized and and so um yeah people were not were reporting it as as, as if it was the same assimilation window but we do see that the model is essentially learning two models one uh, within the assimilation window and it does very well that doesn't have zero error uh we think for two reasons one it's it's not it's not learning through age risk uh not learning the true physics models and two the the physics model also does not fully predict itself within the simulation window because it has to uh, come like explain all these noisy sensing right and then once you cross the simulation window you have you have very high errors well not very high but like comparatively very high errors uh yeah yeah thanks mm -hmm. so what would be the optimal way of doing this because i mean the setting you have is uh the raw data is not dense enough for you to train a good model so you use uh this reanalysis of some sort would it yeah. would the right most favorable approach to, would be to have a different assimilation policy and rerun the entire air five would it be um would you want to have i'm not sure do you, do you have ensembling for air five would that help or hurt you yeah that's a good question so i think there is a uh, two answers to this one is in the short term the best thing to do is evaluate is take it a five or at least what we've started doing is we take it a five we fine tune on this is a smaller open national analysis data set and then we are comparing apples to apples and everyone's happy um and that's actually we've already deployed so if one goes to this european weather agency we can already see the graph cast models real, real uh, running on real uh, real feet uh at real time and that's how we actually did it we trained with this four years in the era five and then fine-tuned um However, there is an even better thing to do, uh, which is kind of probably long, long term, which is just training on raw observations, right? Machine learning doesn't care about the type of, of data that it runs. So in, we should just go to the rawest, uh, richest source of information, which is just taking raw, raw observations, which they will not be uniform in, in time or space. So it's actually a very challenging research problem to work with this. Uh, and also probably they're huge but it's probably what you want to do eventually which the model then will, will have to learn to assimilate the data itself as well but that's kind of more long term cool uh so in summary uh using this 6 a.m and 6 p.m uh was solving two problems first there are five initializations at midnight and noon could potentially have a nine hour look ahead from a simulation and this can give a could have given a, an advantage to graphcast uh so we only used 6 a.m and 6 p.m um, so one issue though, and that's why you had this kind of dashed line is that address only, uh, the published address predictions only look, um, up to three days, three and a half days, sorry. So after this three and a half day curve, we actually had to compare uh, the 6, uh, AM, 6 PM, uh, graph cast against 12 AM and 12 PM performance of interest. Of course, not predictions, but literally the RMSE metrics of 12 AM, 12 PM against 6 AM, 6 PM. And so uh, the the second is kind of going back to uh, Kevin's uh, point about um, it's easier to predict within the same assimilation window rather than across the simulation window. So what we do is actually only report errors every 12 hours so that we're in the same point in the assimilation window. And we found this to be the most consistent. Another disadvantage of the RMSC metrics is that uh, in general, RMSC rewards models that average over uncertainty. And in fact, models like GraphCast are often trained to minimize RMSC, which means that the training itself may teach the model to blur. And in fact, if we look at the power spectra of some of the variables, we see that indeed, as we increase the forecast lead time, some of the power in the high frequency diminishes. So of course, uh, the, the question is whether it is possible that GraphCast metrics are better simply because it blurs more uh, when the address which is just trying to mimic the raw physics, uh, does not work. And so to control for this, we recomputed the main metrics, but we now applied a post-processing step, which adds a spatial filter to each of the models, uh, allowing it to blur the output. 
And the filter specialized for each model, each variable, and each lead time. So that each filter allows to minim minimize our MSC. And this is what we call in the paper optimal filtering. Uh, the plot on the right shows a dotted line, uh, how the results of each model change as you apply this optimal filtering. And interestingly, not just Idris, but actually also GraphCast can obtain a lower RMSC by applying opt uh, this optimal filtering. But we uh, fortunately see that GraphCast still outperforms Idris after this optimal filtering. So we must be learning a better weather uh, model, not just um, kind of tweaking these RMSC metrics. Cool. Yep. So I understand that. So you're essentially sharpening the generation from GraphCast to make it, you're unblurring it with a post process? No, no, the opposite. We are uh, blurring it to, so because we know that blurring uh, cheats the RMSC metric, we allow both GraphCast and uh, HRS to blur. We oh, oh, I see. So HRS has a free parameter for each variable to blur as much as it wants to minimize its error. Exactly, exactly. And we thought that that was the main thing, right? We wanted to allow HRS to, to trick the RMSC metric as, because we thought GraphCast probably was tricking the RMSC metric by blurring. So we thought, let's give Atrius that, that, that option as well. Oh, I see, okay. And then we also added this to GraphCast, just in case we see that it helps not as much, right? You can see that the the, the black line goes uh, lower much more than the blue line goes. And in particular, one thing, let me see if it can be seen in these graphs, yes. Uh, you can see that the dashed line is only better than the blue line, like the dashed blue line is only better than the non dashed line after uh, about three days, which is our training objective. We only train up to two, uh, up to three days. And we hope that after training up to three days, lead time, it generates up to 10 day performance. And as you can see that blurring doesn't help be, um, much be, uh, with less than three days. And we think that's that's because indeed, the model has learned to blur up to three days. And then after this optimal filtering actually helps to blur even more um, and fully kind of cheating as much as possible is our MSC metric by blurring. But we see that when you allow both models to blur as much as they want, uh, GraphCast still got, does better predictions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks for the question. Okay, so uh, I guess that the takeaway is that the fair comparison uh, between operational models and ML models train our AI5 is pretty tricky, especially when models are initialized from different analysis and when models have different uh, or of different nature, right? So one potential solution, which I believe it is becoming more common recently, as we were discussing before, is to evaluate the model on the operational setting rather than ETA5. So in terms of potential solutions, is uh, I guess this is one of them. And so uh, this is the results on the operational analysis themselves after we fine tuned. Uh, so after the, the first uh, archive, uh, we published this. And so, um, once one suggestion is that hopefully an next version of era 5 will have these aligned <laughs> assimilation windows that are closer to the operational setting. And uh, as I was saying before, uh, uh, to Greg's question, uh, really the best thing to do is, is evaluate against observations. So, so just one thing that we I wanted to show is that we wanted to check the biases of our model in certain regions of the world. Uh, for instance, this animation shows where the model underestimates, uh, which you can see in blue, or overestimates in red, the surface temperature, and it does so in different places on the Earth. And uh, as the animation uh, goes along, it's different forecast lead times. So looking at this plot, we see that indeed the model has biases, and that these biases uh, change with uh, forecast lead time. Uh, however, uh, while this may seem like a lot of biases, actually uh, these biases are comparable to the biases that uh, of ages in terms of magnitude, and they are both of them uh, grow in time. And we also actually found some correlation between ages and GraphCast in terms of the biases. Cool. Another thing that we did was training uh, to make sure that, like, to to understand really the the effect of the data re recency on on the model. And what we did was evaluating on 2021. And we tried training on uh, up to 2018, which is our, our main model. So instead of, we train up to 2017, and the main result is testing on 2018. But now we looked at 2021. And you can see that performance is still better than HRS, but uh, not as much as one would hope. But as we add uh, more recent data, performance keeps improving and improving. And so the closer we go to 2021, uh, the better we do on 2021, which uh, is, is nice to see um, but we also indicate that there's probably some distribution shift we don't know whether this is due to climate change or also 
a better uh, sensing modalities, right? Because the uh, ADA 500 simulation data set has been created with uh, raw sensors and these sensing modalities have been improving over time. Another uh, application that we did in our model is removing these long edges that we were saying before. Um, maybe they were learning some, some non-physical uh, parameters. And we see that in general, they tend to help, especially on geopotential and, and mean sea level pressure, which are essentially the same, the same quantity at different levels of the atmosphere. And these are tend to be smoother fields. So we think that probably that's why uh, having these long edge dependencies uh, helps in, in both cases, but it seems to help across the board. And finally, uh, we also looked at the effect of autoregressive training, right? So uh, one, we have the option of just training to do well at six hours or training the same model to do well at six hours and 12 hours or uh, training it up to 12 hours, uh, autoregressive step. And we see that it's, a, it's essentially performing a trade-off. Uh, so uh, the model when we only train it on one autoregressive step is the best model at one autoregressive step. And as we increase the number of training steps, we're essentially shifting the curve and balancing um, doing better at longer lead times uh, with doing worse at shorter lead times. So in conclusion, uh, the graph cast output outperforms interest, which is the best operational model uh, in many ways. We have seen how it does better in the typical RMSC metrics, but we have seen that also this translates to better uh, real applications. It's also worth noting that now inference just went down from one hour to one minute, which also allows us if we wanted to uh, in the future run and predict an ensemble of predictions, not just a single prediction, that would also be much cheaper to do. And we think that we have to be careful and uh, make comparisons that not just uh, apply to our MSC, but real, real applications that, uh, that benefit the end user. And the second conclusion is that deep learning weather models are probably here to stay. Uh, so last year and 2023 have been kind of uh, key years uh, where deep learning has started to surpass uh, numerical weather prediction. And uh, as the data keeps increasing, any uh, earth scale modeling using deep learning is going to uh, out outperform uh, classic physics. And that's it. Thank you for your attention. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. Um, are there questions on the call? Well, okay. So let me, oh, yeah. You, Jung? Uh, I have a question about, um, have you aware about Google has already um, released our weather bench and what's the difference between the weather bench and, and this? And I see weather bench has uh, also include this paper for GraphCast and also the Pangrus transformer uh, weather model. And yep. then, so what would be like you, you guys, because I know Google has been consolidated with DeepMind, so do you guys were like, uh, actually cooperate together or just different types of model? And what's the purpose have two different types of model? So there are so many weather forecasts and and also NVIDIA has their, their weather forecast too. And and I just want to know the purpose because I'm a hydrology purpose. And there are so many and, and I'm not sure that weather forecast will help for, for hydrologists. Yeah. I didn't understand the, la the last sentence, but in general, so there's two answers to your question. One is what is weather bench and, and its relationship to GraphCast. Weather bench, as kind of the name implies, it's it's more like the the benchmark than the methodology. So uh, weather bench, I forgot if actually the well, there is some sharing between the authors in in uh, in our paper and weather bench. Actually, uh, I was not involved in weather bench, but uh, many of my colleagues were. And essentially, just think about it as the benchmark. So just uh, uh, as a standard platform to evaluate weather models, and uh, yeah, thanks for sharing the link. And whether Bench 2 uh, was, uh, which is the, the link you shared, uh, was recently open sourced uh, to essentially just standardize weather prediction because there are many things that one can do. <laughs> uh, can can um, There's many mistakes that one can do when evaluating weather models and uh, they make the right decisions, hopefully, and to make a standard for, for the industry. And actually, the, the creation of that benchmark itself kind of answers the, I think, the, the second part of your question, which is why there are that many models and is it worth it to have that many models? And my answer is that probably yes, uh, in, in research, uh, kind of this healthy competition across many different ideas, different teams, that's what makes uh, progress go farther and, and we build on each other's ideas and we create um, but some amount of independence. Uh, to be able to explore different paths. Like for instance, uh, NVIDIA uses uh, Fourier neural operators. Um, um, Pango was using transformers. We use graph neural networks. 
each of us is going to discover different things. And so we're going to build on each other's uh, discoveries. And I think that's kind of the beauty of research and, and kind of also, um, yeah, what enriches this field. Yeah. 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 I'm just a uh, follow up uh, your answer. So I want to know, like, do you just, just give you a case, like, because you, you mentioned about atmosphere river. So in case I like, always model, like predict. So how does the, your model predict for atmosphere river landfolding location or, or landfolding? I mean, the, the IVT pass will, will be much more accurate than actually using the weather satellite measurement. I'm, I'm just curious. Yeah. 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 I, I'm not an expert in this. Uh, I think Remy Lam, if you want to uh, send him a message, that he was actually the one that did the atmospheric uh, rivers experiment. But as far as I remember, the atmospheric rivers is literally um, a formula involving a few of the variables for every for a few grids. So uh, we have a few grid points in 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 our evaluation, and we literally apply that formula both to the true weather as well as our predictions, as well as interest predictions. And we literally compare those numbers, uh, which one is closer to it. Uh, I don't think we we have paths in the in the in the atmosphere or anything like this. It's not like cyclone, cyclone tracking. I believe it's literally predicting a specific quantity, which I forgot exactly what it was. I, I think it's what we call IVT, if I remember correct. But again, yeah, yeah, that, that's right. Yeah, yeah, that's um, how I did in my PhD. <laughs> right. my PhD. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Thank you. One, yeah, one one thing I guess this is a good show of of the fact that. The machine learning community, it's a, we, we know very little about weather. Uh, we try to learn as much weather as possible and, and kind of be, we think that, that uh, we try to be as careful as possible and as responsible as possible in our evaluation. But we've also been in, in talks with uh, weather experts to make sure that our, our predictions are uh, consistent and meaningful as possible. Uh, and so, yeah, any input that you have, uh, in particular in this field, if it's your expertise, uh, if you message Remy, I'm sure he'll be very glad to talk. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Uh, one more thing. I'll just leave you a link to Freddie Cantor, who I just realized is at Google now, uh, who does so yes, hydrology. So he's done LSTMs for hydrology and as far as I understand, like hooking up different river systems. Uh, and he's done pretty well compared to, you know, physics-inspired hydrological models. So that's another interesting approach. Sure, sure. Thank you. Yeah. And Raj? Yeah. Oh, hi, uh, Ferran. This was great. Uh, I think uh, my question is more as a weather enthusiast or like a hobbyist. Mm -hmm. If uh, if I want to do a crawl, walk, run on your model, do you have some tips or some like pointers that we can use just to have it more on a, trying to st stand that up just to, you know, do it like like your uh, my own like local model for where I live and also I, I was just wondering if you had some tips or some pointer or some like document you can point me to yeah. to like, stand that up from that standpoint. Yeah. Yeah, I, I would recommend we we um, kind of the two links that that are on the slide. In particular, we have all the code for uh, available on GitHub. I don't think we have code for training, but uh, again, if you're saying more like an enthusiast perspective, training yeah. is super expensive. But literally running the evaluation, like running the the, the model prediction, is is relatively cheap. Can be done with a with a regular GPU. Or also starting with a two to the so sorry, uh, I mean like with a smaller model. I think we also open sourced a smaller model uh, that runs at, at lower resolution. Uh, that would also be a good example. And then another thing, I forgot if he has already published the paper, but uh, there was a recent large scale deep learning bond conference where uh, there was a PhD student that used ideas from Graphcast to run a local model, and also. Oh, very cool. Awesome. And yeah. and both ideas from Graphcast and Graphcast predictions, I believe. So to combine it with a higher resolution model that was local. And the intuition is that our resolution is still not the, the resolution that one would get on your phone. So if you get your predictions on your phone, you, you're using a higher resolution model. But That's how it works in practice is that it's informed by a lower resolution global model like, like ours. Oh, awesome. No, that that is good. great. Awesome. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Yeah. And performance wise. So that's probably a big deal uh, in terms of how do you fairly compare the performance? Because you have you're already based on error, so that's been already done. Uh, but uh, the alternative models, how long do they typically take? And like for for a given prediction? Yeah, if I remember correctly, uh, I think it's on the order of one hour. I, um, it's definitely much more than one minute, which is roughly what our predictions right. take. And that's <laughs> and that's kind of the one of the big advantages that ML brings to the table. And that's actually, if you look at some of the papers uh, from one year, two years ago, that's how they were justifying. Uh, they were worse than than traditional uh, uh, 
uh, weather models, um, but they were much faster. Now we have both faster and better. Uh, so, so that's uh, very good. And in terms yeah. of training, how long does that take? No, in terms of training, it's expensive. So we have about three weeks, uh, three weeks and three days, I guess. So 24 days, um, but it's, it's hopefully amortized. Yeah, so one thing that's interesting about weather models is that the training cost is bigger than the test cost, which is not often the case for many, uh, many ML models. Uh, do you have any notions? So you said 32 GPUs how do, and versus 10K CPUs. Is there a yeah. scale comparison between those two? I think I think it's probably cheaper in our front. Uh, I'm pretty sure it's cheaper in our front. Uh, and actually, but one interesting thing is that these weather agencies now have to shift some of their compute to to GPUs because uh, their clusters have been CPU based. Um, so, right. but I think the co the compute cost is much lower now, which is good for the field. Got it. Yeah, oh, Kevin. Yeah, you you mentioned um, ensembles earlier. Like since you're already hooked into ECMWF. Yep. Um, they have an ensemble forecast. Could they not just take the initial conditions and run your graph cast code 60 times and, you know, you'd fill an hour, right? How yep. what, That seems conceptually straightforward. Is it just an engineering task or is there open problems there? No, no, we've done that internally. Uh, and yeah, it's 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 good. It gives good results. Uh, yeah, we haven't published this yet, but it, it can be done because we've done it. <laughs> uh, sorry, I forgot. Sorry, let me just make sure I answer you properly. Uh, sorry, we haven't hooked up, but we've done essentially something very similar of essentially perturbing the initial conditions and evaluating this, and it actually worked great. So mm -hmm. just to um, complete the answer, uh, we we here we say that we're better than the best deterministic model, which is uh, what uh, the CMWF calls HRS, but as you were alluding to, you can perturb initial conditions, run it 50 times, average the results, that gives better performance than the model we compared against, which this is called ENS. But of course, we can do the same to our model, perturb it and uh, average it, and that gives even better performance. And I, we think that this is probably better than ENS. Uh, we have to make sure that uh, we like like we, internally we think that it's better but we i don't want to make this big claim yet because we have no uh, published there is so this is interesting so typically what they do in, in weather folks they have an ensemble common filter have these you know 60 miles running uh, for some of them are wrong kill them kind of push some of the existing population to be to take up the variance of the weather and so on is that your approach like ensemble common filter kind of thing or the neural nets give you a different way of getting those distributions? Oh yeah, in our case, there are literally 50 separate um, predictions if we wanted to make them. Uh, there's a different question on the data simulation, right? So if you wanted to say, what's the weather state, you would need uh, some form of filtering to eventually come up to the, the present, an estimate of the present state. We are relying, as I was saying, kind of one of the, at the very beginning of the slide, it's not a pure end-to-end -end ML approach because the assimilation, uh, the initial state, the input state from which we start is still NWP based. So I want to make, be very clear about this. Uh, we're, we're not a pure ML approach. And so they are probably running some of the filtering that you're, you're talking about, but but we not we don't. On our front is literally, this would be like 50 neural network evaluations. No, but then it, the mode that Kevin I think, was describing is you have 50 of these things, you take weather samples and now you know, in typical weather prediction, you kill some of those which are completely wrong, and you make clones out of the remaining population. Yeah. That's the common yeah. filter. But I get yeah. the you know the hope that if you have like a variational neural net or something like this, you don't have to do something as I don't want to say as, as simplistic as an ensemble kind of filter. You might get some of the, the Bayesian priors into that process. I see. I see. Uh, yeah. I. I'm sorry, I was more familiar with the kind of filtering used for kind of right. assimilation than, than for the future prediction. So I, I misanswered your, your question. Uh, so what I can say is that our preliminary experiments that I was talking about uh, to answer Kevin's, Kevin's point about the, the perturbed ensembles were literally 50 random, 50 independent samples. Right. Uh, we are working, and I think some other teams are working in probabilistic methods uh, that, that that predict the distribution and, and to do this more properly. But uh, we still don't have concrete uh, results to to show. Yeah, fair. Well, yeah. Thank you very much. It was fantastic. Thanks. Thank you.